This is Rosa Chef, and I'm here to guide you to the daily activities, events, and the ins and outs of what occurs on the street. So sit back, relax, enjoy your cup of coffee, purchase one of the something on bus, and enjoy a word from the metaverse. Hello, I'm Rosa Shai here with another episode. I am speaking to you from a cafe, a small cafe adjacent to the famous Black Sun Bar, keeping you on the latest of what's happening on the street and what is affecting our world here in Russia. So on this episode, we are going to talk about the right to connect and SOPA, as well as PIPA. These were bills that were uh, put forth in, in the U.S. Congress uh, between the year of 2010 to 2012, where these uh, internet protection bills that were supposed to help secure the internet and make things uh, better for national surveillance and allegedly protect the world from terrorism, as well as some other really not so great things that were part of the bill. And what ended up happening was there was a, you can say, a protest, an uprising by both technology companies, privacy companies, various social groups, uh, and individuals that uh, really uh, took to the streets, to, to the streets uh, decisions and groups that typically didn't interact with the U.S. government or even the state government at any kind of level were now engaging and participating in the participating in the democratic process, if you will, or if you want to call it democratic process of the United States. And these bills not only just affected the how the internet was going to be conducted in, um, within the states, but also by default the local around. So we're going to talk about that, the right to connect and SOPA and what that all means and why the one of the reasons we're not talking about is we lead up to another protest which is this you know the protest against net neutrality uh, not only against the net neutrality but the takeaway of net neutrality which the United States is that Congress is paying on the FCC is attempting to be and there's going to be on July 12th a blackout day if you will where many parts of the internet are, are just not going to be there they're not going to function they're not going to participate in a 24 hour period, uh, so some level and degree, it's, we'll get into that when we talk about it, but we're going to talk about this, which came, which stopped a series of bills from happening the first time around, and helped propel the, ins- the hacktivism, um, helped put it into the forefront. You know, you had Anonymous, which we talked about, uh, you're having WikiLeaks out there, which we will discuss WikiLeaks and Vault 7 and all that uh, eventually, then you had the uh, Edward Snowden's uh, whistleblowing uh, document, documents. Um, who, and he's not the only whistleblower. There were several whistleblowers, particularly Chelsea Manning, who pretty much confirm what everyone has been saying for decades. If you ever had a crazy uncle, if you will, they always talk about, you know, the government's always watching, the government's doing this, the government's doing that. Well, these batch of uh, documents, the Edward Snowden and Chelsea Manning documents, uh, confirmed for a lot of people what the government's and IRS programs were doing and about privacy and started a completely different shift in perspective on uh, the internet, about government interactions, about the type of uh, connections people have with different corporations, their products, all that uh, kind of bubbled up and boiled over, if you will, into various areas. But before we get into all that, before I know there's a bit of a long, longer intro than normal, we're going to talk about the news. So the dark web has its own lit magazine, a uh, very chic. Uh, this is from Wired. The magazine itself is called The Tortoise, Issue 1. Uh, when most people think about the dark web, and this was written by Charlie Wilk. This came out, it's kind of like an old one, but I, I found it very interesting. It came out last year. Uh, they envision the Silk Road, terrorist networks, pornography, and other social threats. They certainly don't imagine find, finding poetry or short stories or creating nonfiction. And that's the pre- preconception of the founders of the Tortoise. The first literary magazine on the encrypted network tour and hope to prep. There's no reason um, our innocent activists created on the day should be wiretapped, and there's every reason that it should be. Uh, GMH, the anonymous co founder of the Taurus, wrote in an email to Wired uh, in this post noted post Panama Papers here, DH sees the Taurus introducing encryption to a broader audience and giving people another entry point to the dark web. Uh, the poetry of anonymity. Uh, GMH and his co founder, uh, University of Utah communication professor Robert W. Gill, met on the dark web social network uh, Galaxy. Two ever readers, JMH pseudonym is inspired by the 19th century 
English poet uh, Gerald uh, Manley Hopkins uh, recognized the possibilities an encrypted literary platform presents. Using literature to bridge the gap between the dark and the queer web, the reason could push the cybersecurity further into the ministry. Uh, there's all these, these uh, there are these very different kind of UI uh, attempts of connectors to get uh, regular everyday people to utilize cryptography and either connect to the tool or use cryptography in general. Uh, for example, uh, Kiki or WhatsApp uses, you know, Indian encryption, but there's another messaging app, Kiki, uh, that has their own um, token, their own um, crypto token uh, that you can send and, and do transactions with within their messaging apps. It allows you to buy stickers and Kind of like the Snapchat stickers that everyone's been copying. Uh, Kiki does the same thing. Uh, there's also Get Gems, which is supposed to be a, another attempt at uh, social messaging and uh, social network interactions to get people into um, cryptocurrencies. And so this is just another avenue that I just found very fascinating. I'm going to continue on with the, the article here. Uh, the bridge included submissions too. Uh, GMH sought anonymous submissions to Global Leaks, the open source software designed for whistleblowers. Uh, Gail reached out to contributors uh, throughout the digital networks uh, on the Quit Web. Uh, poet journalist Alyssa Port knew about Tor before responding to Gail's open call, but wasn't a regular user. I saw it as a place for immorality and black market activity, but also a rebellion and political reasons, she said. Uh, Porter, who, pro- who was profiled by the New Yorker last year, wrote two poems for the first issue, both addressing the top of Sears reports. I thought a poem about Snowden and preserving data would speak to this audience in a different way in a normal literary context. Uh, published on the dark web might seem counterintuitive for authors who seemingly seek exposure to a bar- broader audience, but as, as Porter sees it, the tourist talks a broader history of the niche or uh, literary magazine. Uh, the web has made uh, cultish literary fandom harder in some ways, she says. Anyone can find any publication online, which makes the search easier and to her mind less meaningful or personal. By publishing on the dark web, she says, the tourist rec- recalls an antiquarian way of reading literature. It is against back to the time when you could find the Evergreen Review review in the sacks at the vintage bookstore. I can see that as a perspective. I, I think there's kind of a bit of a elitist, kind of snobbish perspective. Uh, I think we're going to eventually have to talk about culture and perception when it comes to the web. I, I've seen this brought up more and more how, while it's great that the internet has allowed for broader communication for people to, to connect. People are saying that it's, it's not as meaningful or as personal, and I, I I don't think that's the best mindset, if you will. I think it's almost a kind of a, a detriment or a negative mindset uh, of thinking about the web, and particularly connections people make um, with the various communities and interactions that they make on, online. Uh, cat videos can be secure, too. While the tourist might be the first literary magazine on the dark web, uh, Tor continues creeping towards mainstream application. Fifty uh, percent of active Tor sites are legal under U.S. law. For example, one million users actually access uh, Facebook through Tor each month. And the notion that Tor is the only good for buying ecstasy from a stranger is just an, um, an accurate description of the platform's capabilities, says um, Armin uh, Shanish, a communication professor at the American University and the author of The Pirate Sleeper Site. Most people recognize that the dark web's value as a media outlet in repressive countries, but should Sinich see global relevance in publication on tour. Someone might come to tour to see a movie that they don't want to pay for, he says, but it also allows them to get access to political communication ideas that are being systematically excluded from the queer net. People essentially can use tour much like they use the queer web for greater privacy, for reading unfiltered news, watching cat videos, or oversharing on Facebook, or earning uh, seamless. But first, public understanding of the platform must change. Although Tor and services are easier than ever to access, there's still an aura of technical elitism associated with this skill. He hopes to change that, and one curious reader at time. Like many people, I don't know much code, I don't have a big Bitcoin account, and I've always envisioned the dark web as something vaguely sinister that I neither skills nor the need to access. Uh, Googling how to access Tor may, made me feel devious and a little nervous. But once you download and install Tor using it, it's very straightforward. So much for my imagined transformation into a black hat hacker. Uh, scroll, scrolling through Taurus uh, feels a, a lot like reading other Zins. Uh, the works range from poems to fiction to nonfiction essays generally touch on similar themes to cybersecurity and anonymity. You may catch more references to PGP keys than you do in, say, a ZYZZYBA, 
the magazine is perfectly accessible. Although contributors were named in this issue, DHH says that the majority of submissions for the second have been anonymous. The dovetail nicely with the founder's agenda of offering dark web users an outlet for artistic expression while introducing new readers to the importance of encrypted networks. Tor is a field normally associated with STEM, whereas Zen culture is more associated with liberal arts and students. The two groups may come from different backgrounds, but they share a belief in unsister self-expression. Though through its form and content, the image hopes to change the misconceptions from both audiences. The tours can provide literature, literature buffs with compelling reasons to access to on the dark web. And the magazine's success could convince dubious technologies that a literary magazine isn't um, anarchism. Uh, literature can still archi- articulate the certitudes, and the dark web can eliminate them. So there you have it. And then Proton VPN. Uh, Proton is Proton Mail, it's a company that um, bases Sweden. Uh, if you listen to the Mr. Robots uh, F Society uh, podcast, uh, my review show of the, the television show Mr. Robot, you know that the main character, Elliot, uses Proton Mail for uh, his emailing. Um, it's an email service I utilize, and if you are a paid member, you um, had access to the earlier version of Proton VPN, and they have now launched it available for um, everyone who is a uh, Proton uh, Mail subscriber. So here we go. Uh, Proton VPN. Uh, three years ago, we launched Proton Mail, and today we're launching Proton VPN. That that launch was June 20th, uh, 2017. So we're happy to announce that as of uh, 12 p.m. Geneva time, Proton VPN is now available to the general public. Proton VPN is officially not a beta, and we're allowing open signups for the first time. You now can directly get Proton VPN by visiting. After more than one year of development and four months of beta testing by over 10,000 members of the Proton Mail community, we're finally making Proton VPN available to everyone. And we really mean everyone. Because consistent with our mission to make privacy and security accessible to every single person in the world, we're also releasing Proton VPN as a free VPN service. It's been a long and exciting journey to get here since our first team met at CERN in 2013. Back then, we had an ambitious ambitious vision to build an internet that was free and could continue to reach its full potential as a tool for social progress. Indeed, that was the vision inspired Kim uh, Bursin Lee to create a, the World Wide Web at CERN in 1989. Since then, the internet has met or even succeeded its promise in certain areas, but this has not come without a cost to society. While the internet has done a great deal of good over the course of the digital revolution, we have lost control of our data, our most intimate secrets, and ultimately our privacy. In certain countries, the internet has even become a tool for oppression and control, instead of a beacon of hope and freedom it once was. Back in 2013, we embarked on the journey to change this by building the tools that can make privacy and security for the vault online. In 2014, on the 25th anniversary of the web, our efforts culminated with the release of Proton Mail, the source's first end-to-end encrypted email service. Since then, millions of people around the world have embraced our vision, thanks to your support and numerous donations along the way, email is much safer today than it was several years ago. However, then consider the scope of all we do online, email is just a small piece of the online world. That's why we decided to build Proton VPN to better protect the activists, journalists, and individuals who are currently using Proton Mail to secure their online lives. A VPN, or virtual private network, allows users to browse the web without being tracked, bypass online censorship blocks, and also increase security by pa- by pa- by- bypassing all internet traffic through a strongly encrypted tunnel. The importance of VPN for online security and privacy is increasing day by day. Back in April of this year, Obama-era FTC rules designed to protect the privacy of the internet browsing history were rolled back. Fast forward to today, and attempts are being made to dismantle net neutrality. In the U.S. and several European governments are now calling for increased online surveillance. And last but not least, for over 1.5 billion people around the world, the internet does not live up to its promise of freedom of information. Instead, the internet is a highly restricted and censored place, constantly under surveillance while making a wrong move could lead to imprisonment or worse. We are also aware that Proton Mail becomes a stronger force for digital freedom. The censorship of Proton Mail in certain countries is not a matter of it, but a matter of when. Earlier this year, we took the first steps to improve Proton Mail's availability on our censorship by launching an Onion site. With Proton VPN, we can ensure the accessibility of not only Proton Mail, but also the world's digital knowledge and information. And that's why we're committed to providing a free version of Proton VPN. However, we've done more than to make Proton Mail. Proton VPN free. We also work to make it the best VPN service we were ever created by addressing many of the common pitfalls with VPNs. For example, Proton VPN features a secure core architect, which routes traffic through multiple encrypted tunnels in multiple countries to better defend against network-based attacks. It also features a seamless integration with Tor 
and MIDI network. You can learn about all these steps we took to build a secure VPN here. There's a lot of links. Um, I highly recommend if this is something you're interested in to, um, there will be a link in the show notes to the, to the blog post for you to read through here. This is very fascinating information and we will eventually do um, a Horizon Thought Bubble on Photon Mail and Photon VPN. But lastly, we're building a VPN service that can be worthy of our trust. We understand when it comes to VPNs, trust is paramount. Whether it's our tra- transparent VPN threat model, our Swiss jurisdiction, our reputation, our relationship with the community, or the fact we actually know who we are, we're committed to building our op- and operating Proton VPN with the same level of transparency that came to the characters characterized Proton Mail. To all of you who have supported us over the years, thank you for your support. Unlike companies like Google and Facebook who use your users' privacy to sell advertisement, Proton Mail and Proton VPN are entirely dependent on users updating the paid accounts to cover operating expense. Without your support, these projects would not be able to thrive and grow. If you appreciate the security and privacy that Proton VPN provides and have the same means to do so, please consider upgrading to a PC. This allows us to support the millions around the world without both these needs. With your help, the revolution we have started with Proton Mail will continue, and we will reach the day where the internet ser- serves all of us equally and reaches its full potential as a tool for the best regards to Proton Technologies team. And Mozilla. Uh, Mozilla, I'm kind of reading a lot of these uh, little different company blogs here today because it's just this with the theme of the episode, but it's also very important. Uh, Mozilla blog, the past, dispatches from the internet frontier. So, uh, June 21st, a $2 million prize to decentralize the web applied today. We're filling a healthy internet by supporting big ideas that keep the web accessible, decentralized, and resilient, and what will you build? Mozilla and the National Science Foundation are offering a $2 million prize for the big ideas that decentralize the web and we're accepting applications today. So this is, you know, for storage, IFE, there's all these different projects out there that can really, if they were to submit or someone else maybe off the Ethereum platform or submit could greatly help um, the open source cost movement, you know, people out there that seek to be decentralized. This type of uh, capital will help them, but also uh, the public awareness to generate even more capital to build these decentralized platforms, and it's brilliant that Mozilla is doing this. But anyways, uh, Mozilla believes the internet is a global public resource that must be open and accessible to all. In the 21st century, a lack of internet access is far more than inconvenience and is a staggering disadvantage. Without access, individuals miss out on substantial economic and educational opportunities, government services, and ability to communicate with friends, family, and peers. Currently, 34 million people in the U.S., 10% of the country's population, lack access to high-quality internet connectivity. This number jumps to 39% in rural communities and 41% on tribal lands. And when disaster strikes, millions more on lo- can lose vital connectivity right when this need the most. To connect the unconnected and disconnect across the U.S., the Mozilla Today is accepting applications for the Wireless Innovation for the Network Society, or WINS Challenge. Sponsored by the NSF, a total of $2 million in prize money is available for wireless solutions to get people online after disaster or the connect communities lacking reliable internet access. Details, the off-the-grid internet challenge. Off the grid internet challenge. When disasters like earthquakes and hurricane strikes, communication networks are among the first pieces of critical infrastructure to overload or fail. How can we leverage both the internet's decentralized design and current wireless technology to keep people connected to each other and vital messages and rapid service in the aftermath of disaster? Challenging applications will be expected to design both the needs to access wireless, i.e., hardware, and the application provided on top of the network, i.e., software. Projects should be portable, easy to power, and simple to access. Here's an example, a backpack containing a hard drive, computer, battery, and Wi-Fi router. The router provides access via the Wi-Fi network to resources on the hard drive like maps and messaging applications. Smart Community Network Challenges. Many communities across the U.S. lack reliable internet access. Sometimes commercial providers don't supply affordable access, and sometimes a particular community is too isolated. Sometimes the speed and quality of access is just slow. How can we leverage existing infrastructure, physical, and network to provide high-quality wireless connectivity to communities in need? Challenging applicants should plan for high density of users, far region range, and robust family. Projects should also aim to make a minimal physical footprint and uphold users' privacy and security. Here's an example. A neighborhood wireless network where the nodes are housed in and draw power from disused phone booths or similar underutilized infrastructure. These challenges are open to individuals and teams, nonprofits, and for profits. Applicants could be academic, uh, technology activists, entrepreneurs, or makers. We welcome anyone with big ideas and passions for a healthy internet to apply. 
prizes will be available for both early stage design concepts and fully working prototypes. To learn more about Imply, visit uh, wirelesschallengemozilla.org. The challenge is open uh, a Mozilla Open Innovation Competition, which also includes the Equal Rating Innovation Innovation Challenge. And the surfer who saved the world from WannaCry gets ready for the next big virus. So, gave it by Gavin Finch is in Bloomberg Technology. Marcus Hudgens, 23, halted ransomware campaign from a bedroom. He was fast asleep on the English coast when PPS struck. The 23 year old who saved the world from a devastated cyber attack in May was asleep in his bed in the English seaside town of uh, Ifercombe last week after a night of partying when another online extortion campaign spread across the globe. Around 6 p.m. on June 27th, Marcus Hutchison, a self-taught computer security researcher and avid surfer, was awakened by a phone call from a colleague telling him another attack was on the way. Dreading the return of the virulent water cry malware that he stopped at his tracks the previous month, Hutchison's log onto his computer in the house he shares with his parents and younger brother to scan the latest reports. By then, more than 80 Ukrainian banks, government agencies, and multinational firms, including shipping giant AP Moeller uh, Master AS and Russian biggest oil company Rossin PGSC, have been hit by ransomware attacks, spreading like electronic plague across the networks. Within 20 minutes, Hutchison later recounted he got hold of a sample of the malware and was relieved to see it wasn't another one pack, which infected hundreds of thousands of computers in more than 150 countries, but something more targeted and less virulent. Though both attacks took advantage of flaws in Microsoft Corp's Windows operating system to spread their payrolls, WannaCry used the internet to propagate itself. Each compromised computer was scanned and infected another, created a softball snowball effect, which the so-called uh, Petty attack, attack was confirmed to local networks. Uh, the, <coughs> while the so-called Petty attack was confined to local networks, Petty appeared bigger at first because hackers hit the Ukrainian software company NEDOC, and used an automated, automatic update feature to download its malware onto computers of all users of the software, Hutchison said. Unlikely hero. Uh, researchers like Hutchison is probably the Los Angeles-based threat intelligence firm CryptoLogic are akin to Simonologists, a scanning the internet for electronic tumors that could signal the next attack. This time, he was only an observer, but on May 12th, Hutchison stopped the WannaCry attack that crippled organizations from Britain's National Health Security to uh, Dutch, Deutsche Bahn in Germany and uh, Rosola SA factories across Europe. With a mop of curly hair and baggy jeans, t-shirts, and sneakers, Hutchison is an unlikely hero. He rarely leaves uh, rural North Devon, where he lives uh, since he was eight, and hadn't traveled abroad, abroad until last year. He learned to program computers at 12 and was tracking disrupted botnet attacks from his own enjoyment before anyone paid him to do so. Hutchins started a blog under the pseudonym Malware Tech while, he, while still a teenager and was hired by Cryptos in 2015. He said, he said his parents and friends don't even know he had a job until the WannaCry attack. Uh, cheesy chips. Hutchins was supposed to be enjoying a week's holiday, but returning home after a lunch of burgers and cheese chips with a friend and seeing the carnage WannaCry was inflicting, he couldn't resist jumping in. The fact that so many NHS trusts were being hit at the same time was pretty much unprecedented. Hasha said in an interview a few weeks after the attack, drinking Coca-Cola in a hotel bar in Ifercombe, a futuristic but faded tourist town, that for me was a massive red flag that showed that this thing was spreading on its own. Most ransomware which encrypted files on a targeted machine to force its order to make a payment in exchange for decryption is spread via email attachment from rogue senders that infect host computers when they, they're open. Hutchins said he expected a handful of people to click on a mass email over a few days, not thousands of employees at a score of medical facilities at the same time. After analyzing his sample of the malware and seeing it spread by exploiting vulnerabilities in the Microsoft network file sharing protocols, he realized it was using a cyber weapon allegedly stolen from the U.S. National Security Agency, known as Internal Blue. It was part of a catch of sophisticated NSA hacking tools targeting Microsoft software software that was attained by the Shadow Brokers criminal gang last year and leaked on the internet in April. Hutchin also noticed a quirk buried deep in the malware code. It's tested for an existence of an unregistered nonsensical domain name. He properly registered the domain for 8.5 pounds or 11 US dollars and redirected all traffic to a server designed to capture malicious data known as a sinkhole, which allowed him to monitor the progress of the attack. Although he didn't realize at the time, Hutchison had inadvertently triggered the malware's kill switch. Before affecting encrypting the computer's hard drive, uh, WannaCry would query the domain, and as long as it remained unregistered, would proceed with the attack. 
Now, when the malware checked the domain and found it active, it immediately shut down, and about 100 million attempts to affect computers, including more than 7 million in the U.S., have been mitigated since then, according to crypto data. At the time, we were just like, yeah, you can, we can track it now. We don't know that we stopped it, Hunter said. The minute we registered the domain, we were looking at 5,000 or 6,000 unique systems all connecting, and it went up to 200,000 within an hour. I just remember thinking, holy shit, this is really big. Hutchin is part of a global community of online security researchers and bloggers who battle with hackers and cyber criminals from their home offices at all hours of the day and night. And given the wave of attacks in recent years, they're, they're in high demand from governments and corporations and can manage six-figure salaries while still in their early 20s. Hutchin said he had been courted by some of the world's biggest cybersecurity firms. In 2015, he interviewed with the Britain's top security government communication headquarters, but went to work for cryptos instead after they made him an offer he said he couldn't refuse. Great Cyber Warrior says ta- natural talent says uh, Solomon Nino 33, crypto's chief executive officer who hired Hutchison at Marinian's blog. He was obviously solving hard problems and he wasn't doing it for a monetary reward. And those are some of the key traits of a great cyber warrior. Nino, a self taught programmer who got his first computing job at 15, co founded cryptos nine years ago. The firm doesn't do any marketing and has no salespeople among his 25 employees. Hutchison says he doesn't ask for a for a raise after Rana cried because he had just been given one. He wouldn't say how much he earns, but money goes a long way in Ifocom, where one of five children come home from a family whose income is less than 60% of the national average. He says he invests his earnings in stocks and Bitcoin and made thousands of pounds short in the British currency after the country voted to leave the European Union last year. And given the nature of his work and his tendency to sound off on social media without much of a filter, Hutchins has kept his online and real world separate. No one knew what on um, either side what the other side did, he said. Change forever. Want to probably change that forever. After registering the domain that Friday af- afternoon in May, Hushins posted a link to it online so others can track their attacker's progress. Within a few hours, it became clear that Want to Cry had stopped itself propagating. Fellow researchers started tweeting that it was um, at malware tech blog to save the day. Pretty soon, he was being bombarded with thousands of emails and direct messages on Twitter from journalists and security com- companies wanting to know whether their client- clients had been infected. I just knew it was only a matter of time before his identity was blown in the mist, feeling a little scared. Generally, you don't want to advertise what you're doing as you don't want to piss off the bad guys, she said. We published the tracker not knowing who you folded, foiled it. Had I known that, I wouldn't have publicized that it was me. Angry criminals are the worst criminals. For the next 72 hours, Hutchison went without sleep while fending off ever more aggressive attacks from hackers trying to take his servers offline, disable the kill switch, and repropagate water cry. Hutchison thinks that was mostly, mostly the work of low-level, semi-skilled hackers referred to in the industry as skids or script kiddies. They aren't in it for the money, he said. They're just like causing as much trouble as possible. Pretty shocked. By Sunday, the British media had identified Hutchison as the man who stopped Wanna Cry, and the next day he had journalists camped outside his house, 170 miles from London, stuffing business cards through his letterbox or ringing the doorbell. At one point, Hutchison jumped over the back wall of his yard and fled through a car park. When I was outed, my parents were pretty shocked, and my friends still don't believe that I have a job. Being unmasked is pretty horrendous. Hudgens claims not to like people very much, but he's at home engaging. And several times during a walk around uh, Ifrakong's harbor and through his narrow streets, friends and acquaintances called out greetings. He chased up being identified as a hero and said he doesn't have plans to move, though he did enjoy a recent trip to Copenhagen to give a speech at, at an industry convention. What we did with Wanna Cry is impressive in terms of scale, but we stopped, but on a technical level, all we did was register the domain. My employer was already paying me way more than I was worth, so the whole WannaCry thing didn't really change anything. Crypto's Neo is adding that Hutchinson deserves to be called a hero and warns that everyone should prepare for more attacks. We're going to see a wave of these attacks and shadow bro- brokers makes, make good on their promises to release more exploits, Neo said. They make good on every other threat, so there's no reason to think they won't this time. Uh, Pythia was proof for, for more to come. After pulling another all-nighter, Hutchinson said, so Hutchinson said he wanted to get, go back to bed. And something a bit of the weird, but just completely fascinating, to me anyways, is the Waka Vader is real. Behold, the maglev multi-lift that goes up, down, and left to right. Uh, this is another wire story. Uh, standing over a naval town in Germany is one of the country's tallest towers, and insight and innovation that its creators will hope revolutionize the shapes of cities. I highly recommend um, watching the video, because it's just mind-boggling. The, the best description I can give to you is if you ever seen, like, a, a tornado in real life or uh, ever been in the middle of a hurricane or you ever seen a, uh, 
I don't know why I'm picking national disasters here, an earthquake, and you're, you're looking out the window and you can see the other buildings shaking. It's just your eyes can't, your eyes are seeing it, but you can, your brain can't comprehend what's going on. It's very much like this video with this elevator and the things that it can do. I'm not going to read the entire article, but basically, have you ever seen the movie um, or read the book, A Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory? Uh, they pretty much, that's what they invented. It's also, in a sense, similar to, what is that Tom Cruise movie? Oh, it had, like, it was a Philip Dick, Philip, uh, Philip Dick story. Ah, Minority Report, where he was in a self-driving car, and it was going, uh, backwards, forwards, and sideways. It's, it's kind of almost like that, in a sense, but an elevator. Uh, the water baker can go sideways and slantways, and long ways and back ways and square ways and front ways. More than 45 years later, the multinational conglomerate, uh, this and Crook is turning Ma Roland Dahl's fiction into fact. In Rotwell, 100, km 100 kilometers southeast of Stuttgart, stands the tower light, a 246 meter concrete tower that houses a 4,000 a day conference room. A 360 degree viewing platform, Europe, Europe's highest, and a series of 12 shafts built specifically for testing elevators. The 43 uh, pound tower was designed by architects Hullet John and uh, Weiner Subic. Due to be completed in July, the final step is to put an elegant corkscrew sheath of nearly indestructible translucent material that changes color as the sun moves across the sky. Yeah, that's just balls crazy. Uh, when wired visit is clear hot day from the observation deck, the Shishibin, Shishibishi Alp and Swiss Alps are just visible. A glass elevator rises up the side of the building to the 26th floor, which brings on the sense of vertical as the horizon rapidly extends the, across the green countryside. What's special about the building, building the views, obviously, Ross, uh, Andres uh, Schneiderbeck, the CEO of this and Coop, Elevator Division ordered to construct the construction of the tower in 2015 to test the company's new lifts, even when they're necessary to the point of destruction. The bottom is reinforced to take the impact of the entire lift cable free falling oh my God, at terminal velocity up to the maximum of 40 tons traveling 160 kph. A mass, stable, state, a mass stabling system that stops the tower swinging too much on a windy day can be activated to simulate vibrations in tall buildings up to 75 centimeters or the imagined conditions in ones that haven't been even built yet. The tower is where the company's latest invention has been unveiled, an elevator that can move vertically, side to side, and diagonally. The Multi is the first ropeless lift built using the same magnetic levitation technology used in Japan's bullet train and proposed for the Hyperloop. This is so sci-fi, it's just, it's just mind-boggling. In the same way the train slides it, across the track horizontally. The lift travels both vertically, horizontally, and diagonally across the building, riding an electromagnetic field, a system known as a linear drive. If you can run a 500-ton train on magnets at 500, uh, uh, at 500 kilometers per hour, you should be able to elevate a, a cabin at 500 kilograms or 1,000 kilograms at a speed of 5 meters per second, Scheichenberg said. A uh, standard rope employee lifts today can rise to the maximum of about 500 meters. The skyscrapers are much taller, and they're only getting higher. So far, the solution to this has been to build multiple elevators and therefore more shafts, but the space required can cost a building up to 40% of the highly valuable floor space. This cannot go on forever, Scheichenberg said. While the multi can cost three to five times more than the standard lift system, Scheichenberg claims that saving that much space is a central downtown building, for example, is definitely overcompensating the price of the product. The multi-bit is, is, is built with a system of single slim shafts that can fit as many cabins as required, much like an underground rail system. They can be removed or added depending on the traffic and frequency at certain times of day. And what we did it was we just took a train and we adjusted it 90 degrees up and we put it into a shaft, he said. And then it kind of goes on. Um, again, I highly recommend just uh, viewing the video. It's just, it's just very trippy. And that is it for the news. On to our discussion about the right to connect and uh, about the bill SOPA and PIPA and the protests around it. So a quick little update before we get into the news. Uh, this is Hands Up, which is a nonprofit 
crowdsourcing organization. It is these things called bootstraps. And one of these projects is a basic income project. They are seeking to raise 50000 plus for subjects to participate in our American basic income trial. So they have one day left uh, to, as a recording of this episode, which is uh, July 8th. They have uh, one day left to fund, so July 9th. Actually, no, it's two days. July 9th and 10th. To, so by the time it's posted, they have one day left. I'm sorry. Getting my calendar days mixed up. Uh, they will have one day left to fund, and they're at around 40K, so they have a little bit ways to go, 85% funded. And what they're seeking to do is, you know, basically do a basic income program, do a study about it within the states. They already have participants. They just need the funds to do so. And I just wanted to uh, highlight this this project because there's a lot of government projects that are being um, touted, touted out there. Um, Mark Zuckerberg and uh, what else? Who else? Uh, Mark Cuban, uh, Elon Musk, Bill Gates. A number of technologists are um, talking about basic income and talking about the need for basic income and something that we need to do. Uh, but I highly encourage if you are interested in basic income, we discuss about this on the on the Word for the Metaverse. That uh, if you can participate in this or at least follow this project, I have a link in the show notes. But I expect to see more of these type of projects to be coming out both at the governmental, maybe, uh, you know, both nationalistic, uh, maybe Providence or state Pacific, uh, even I would imagine some, uh, companies, you know, might do this through either through grants or through some kind of program because many companies have like charitable programs of that nature for either because they're into the charitable programs or tax write-up purposes have something of this nature, but, and also individual, individual, individualistic funded programs like this where you have small organizations even a larger organizations you know basic income has been talked about for a very long time uh, it goes back centuries it's been really gaining momentum i would say within the last 10 years of the movement within itself and now that technology has come to a point where it's possible to successfully uh, you know fund uh, track break down these things uh, really focus on it and take the time and effort to put this type of an idea out there that you're going to see more of these type of projects. So as our lead up to the blackout date, which is July 12th, uh, 2017, and Wednesday, in which all these different uh, technology-based internet companies are going to blackout there. They're going to not participate in the internet on that day because of the United States government Congress through the use of FCC. Um, current administration to roll back not only privacy protection um, on consumers, but net neutrality. So in our lead up, we're going to talk about a previous movement that occurred very early um, on in this decade uh, against SOPA and what was called the internet slowdown, how it came about, what SOPA and TIPA were, and why it was necessary for these type of uh, protest movements. So before we get begin, we need to talk about what is SOPA and what PIPA. So SOPA. SOPA is a Stop Online Privacy Act. It was to, uh, this is from the Wicca. It was introduced as House uh, 3261 by Lamar Smith, a, a Republican from Texas, on October 26, 2011. It was considered by the House Judiciary Committee. The long title is to promote prosperity, creativity, entrepreneurship, and innovation by combating the theft of U.S. property and for other purposes. <laughs> nice little in clause there. Um, the acronym I'll colloquially refer to as SOPA. So it was a controversial United States bill uh, by U.S. Representative Lamar M. Uh, Smith, Republican from Texas, to expand the ability of the U.S. law enforcement to com- combat online copyright infringement and online trafficking and counter- counterfeit goods. Provisions include the quest of orders to bar advertising networks and payment facilities from conducting businesses with infringed websites and web search engines from linking to, to the websites. And court orders require, require internet service providers to block access to the websites. Uh, the proposed law would have expanded existing criminal laws to include unauthorized streaming of copyrighted content, imposing a maximum penalty for five years in prison. Proponents of legislation said it would protect the intellectual property market and corresponding 
industry, jobs, and revenue, and was necessary to bolster enforcement and copyright laws, especially against foreign-owned and um, operated websites. Claiming flaws in present laws that do not cover foreign-owned and operated websites and citing examples of active promotion of rogue websites by U.S. search engines promotes assert that a strong enforcement tool is needed. The bill received strong bipartisan support in the House Representatives and the Senate. It also received, received support from following organizations, the Fraternal Order of Police, the National Governors Association, the National Conference of Legislation, the U.S. Conference of the Marriage, the National Association of General Generals, the Chambers of Commerce, the Better Business Bureau, the AFL, CIL, and 22 trade unions. The National Consumer League and over 100 associations representing industries throughout the economy which claim they have been harmed by online piracy. Opponents claim that the, the proposed legislation threatens free speech and innovation and enable law enforcement to block access to entire internet domains due to infringed content proposed on a single blog or website. They also claim that SOPA will bypass the safe harbor protections from the liability presented for to websites by the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Some library associations also claim that the legislation emphasized on stronger copyright enforcement to expose libraries to prosecutions. Other proponents claim that the required search engines to delete domain names violated the First Amendment and could begin a worldwide arms race of unprecedented internet censorship. So here we go. This bill is, is again, this is an attempt to enforce copyright onto the internet. And it's just, it's mind boggling that we even still have copyright or even to some point, to some extent, patents. Now, I'm not too against trademarks or branding, if you will, because individuals could, should receive accreditation. They should, should receive acknowledgement and ownership that this is their concept, this is idea, you're getting this product by, you know, Horosia Shide and not some Horosia Shide knockoff. You can know the difference between the different products, even if someone else were to have, you know, there's plenty of podcasts that deal with technology and uh, cryptocurrencies or even reviews in the Mr. Robot show, but you're getting my unique perspective on, under the Hiroja Shai uh, Space Odyssey Network. But the whole copywriting and ownership and that type of deal, it just doesn't work for the 21st century. And at some point, there's going to be a triggering effect to where either it's going to get so far uh, clamping down on this, uh, attempting to expand the DMCA, uh, which has kind of sort of happened, and we will talk about that in a news story and later on in the word of the metaverse. Um, going in, in in depth into that about the overall infrastructure of the internet uh, with the W3C, but it's just it's not allowing for the vast amount of growth and innovation that could that could happen if there weren't any these type of barriers in existence. Uh, the reason why they're so very early on in both the, the 19th and 20th century and just in general of existence when information was freely dispense where there was no such a strong copyright you had all these different type of ideas competing with one another building off of one another and all this innovation going on and it's kind of to some point has slowed down and it's also hampered certain different industries where you're particularly in the medical field and the engineering field particularly when we talk about the right to work and we'll do an update on that as well in these um, episodes leading up to uh, the blackout date so you're having this kind of restriction where you, you don't, you can't break down products and find out how they work and kind of garner your own ideas and build off of them. Uh, you can't take a, a concept or a, a product and have a full understanding of the inner workings and maybe build off from it or have an understanding of any of the type of flaws and making repairs or doing any with, anything with it because of these copyright patents and these restrictions. And because of that, there's not as much innovation and not enough creativity that could potentially happen to bring about solutions. And we'll talk about what happens when you unleash um, information and how some solutions happen because this one person, this one set of eyeballs that wasn't, you know, part of the already existing infrastructure saw this information and came up with a solution. But also just in general, it's very restrictive of First Amendments about fair right usage, about dispensing information, about uh, infringing on people's ability to communicate, forcing um, ISPs and web search, search engines to be law enforcement. And a lot of this, quite frankly, there's like copyright infringement and counterfeit goods. Unless it has to deal with like an overall 
crime organization infrastructure. A lot of this are just very much civil matters and should be handled in like lawsuits and not imprison people for five years because they downloaded a movie or they used a uh, fire stick that has coding on it and can spend 10 years in prison because they decided they, they wanted to watch a bunch of matches with their, you know, their coding enabled fire stick. It's just very unnecessary and it's, it speaks to a larger nature of this, uh, of a culture that we're going to talk about, about the metaverse, about imprisoning people as a mechanism to not only have a, a control over society or certain social groups, but to generate income and funds for various levels of governments, if you will, and private co companies as well. So kind of continuing on with a little bit more description on SOPA. So this came in introduction in 2011. Um, it was something that was talked about. So throughout 2011, this this bill was something that was sort of like whispers in the encountered around about coming out and eventually it dropped October 2011, which is about the period of time when in the fall was the holiday season in the States. So you these type of bills normally like are these trashed up bills, these very controversial bills where Americans in general are just kind of distracted because they're through the holidays. They have like... Uh, Thanksgiving, Christmas, um, it's very busy in the fall, you know, a good percentage of the United States has, actually has winter, so there's snow on the ground, they're more in the homes, they're, you know, getting to and from, and they're not really paying attention to politics in general, if they have children, they're busy with the whole school system and things of that nature, so they're a little bit more distracted, say, than say, during the summer or spring when they have more free time, things are a bit, you know, more open and transparent, if you will. Um, so on July, on January 18, 2012, uh, English Wikipedia, Google, and estimated 7,000 other smaller websites co coordinated a service blackout in protest against the bill. Uh, Wikipedia said that more than 162 million people viewed this banner. Other protests against SOPA, and we'll talk about PIPA, include petition drives, where Google stated it collected over 7 million signatures, boycotts of companies and organizations that supported the legislation, and opposition's rally held in New York City. In response to the protest action, the Recording Industry Association of America said it is dangerous and troubling development when platforms that serve as gateways to information intentionally skew the facts and incite their users and arm them with misinformation. It is very difficult to counter the misinformation when the disseminators also own the platforms. Access the websites of several pro SOPA organizations and companies such as the RIA, CBS.com, and others impeded and blocked with denial service attacks, which started on January 19, 2012. So for complaining members of hacktivist groups like Anonymous claim responsibility and started the attacks with protests of both SOPA and the United States Department of Justice shut down a mega upload on the same day. Uh, some opponents of the bill supported the Online Protection and Enforcement of Digital Trade Act or OPEN as an alternative. And on January 20th, 2012, the House Judiciary Committee chairman postponed plans to draft the bill. The committee remained committed to find a solution on the problem of online privacy that protects Americans' intellectual property and innovation. And the House Judiciary will propose the consideration of the legislation until there is a wider agreement on the solution. Also, this was also a period of time when there's a ramp up of elections. 2012 is an election year in the States. So this is when you start seeing people, you know, politicians and PACs, all these different political organizations begin to like start getting staff and ramping up uh, during this period of time and picking certain issues, whether it be uh, test balloons or test marketing, if you will, because that's pretty much what they're doing, to kind of gauge um, their constituents and see what um, issues they can put forth uh, during the election year, what they can't put forth the election year, but what can get their guy elected and raise funds off of. So there's, there was a lot of weirdness with this particular Stop Online uh, Piracy Act. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the alternative. The Online Protection Enforcement and Digital Trade Act, uh, as a bill introduced in the United States Congress, proposed as an alternative to the Stop Online Pirate Act. Um, the text of the bill is available for public comment at keepthewebopen.com. So it was proposed by Senator Ron Wyden of Oregon, a Democrat and Republican, uh, a Republican Representative Daryl Issa of California. Wyden first introduced the open in Senate on December 17, 2011, with co sponsors Jerry Morin of Kansas, Maria Catwell of Washington, and ISIS and 25 other, 25, 25 other uh, co sponsors introduced open in the House. Uh, the Senate bill is, uh, the bill number is 2029, uh, the House number is 3782, and that, the House one is delivered on January 18th, 2012, a day before the uh, 
blackout date, if you will. The Senate bill is referred to the Finance Committee and the House bill was referred to the Judiciary Committee. Um, on January 14, 2012, in response to two White House petitions, White House technology official Victoria Espinia, Ashia Chopper, and Howard Schmidt stated an effort to combat, combat online privacy must guard against the risk of online censorship and lawful activity and must not inhibit innovation by our dynamic business, large and small. We must avoid creating new cyber, cyber security risks or disrupting the underlying architecture, architecture of the internet. So the Open Act was proposed to, to alter it into the Protect IP Act, which is PIPA. We'll get into the PIPA after this, which was approved by the United States Judiciary Security on May 20th and closely related to stop online uh, so far. So the Open Act seeks to stop transfer of money to foreign websites whose primary purpose is piracy or counterfeiting. While SOPA and PIPA also seek to require internet providers and search agents to, re to redirect users away from viewing the sites. The Protect IP Act opposed... Okay, so that's what uh, Open Act does. Open places a forcible responsibility on the United States International Trade Commission, which currently adjudicates patent-related disputes rather than the United States Justice Department. The ICTC would be given power to collect fees come from complainants and to hire additional personnel for investigation. So again, this is, you know, it went, instead of having it being a, a legal judicial matter with prison time, it was shifting it into a civil matter where you're going to get lawsuits and fees and fines. Proponents of the Open Act describe it as to keep the web open website as a way to protect the rights of artists like SOPA and protect IP, but differ, different from its rivals when I under, introducing a new internet police power or undermining calls for open internet in closed societies. And by protecting legitimate internet businesses, social media, legitimate websites, and internet innovation. So it wasn't going to strip the additional uh, millennial act with this act as well. They say their proposal, but not as rivals, ensure that intellectual property cases be resolved by intellectual property experts and will target the actual criminals running foreign rogue sites. Uh, they criticize SOPA but not protect IP for failing to apply due process to judging websites. Uh, the open draft was backed by web companies such as Google and Facebook, whereas SOPA and PIPA were backed by move, the movie and music industry. So let's talk about PIPA. So protect the IP Act, uh, preventing real online threats to economic creativity and theft of the Intellectual Property Act, or PIPA. It was introduced in the Senate by Patrick Leahy on May 12, 2011. It was a proposed law with a stated goal of giving the U.S. government and copyright holders additional tools to curb access to rogue websites dedicated to the sale of infringing on counterfeit goods, especially those registered outside the U.S. The bill was introduced on May 12, 2011 by Senator uh, Patrick Leahy, a Democrat from Vermont, and 11 bipartisan co-sponsors. The Congressional Budget Office estimated the implementation of the bill will cost the federal government $47 million through 2016 to cover enforcement costs and the hiring and training of 22 New special agents and 26 resort staff. That is not enough to enforce what they were seeking to do. Uh, the Senate Judicial Committee passed the bill, but Senator Ron Wieden, or Wieden of Democratic Oregon placed a hold on it. The Protect IP Act is a rewrite of the, uh, the Combat Online Infringement and Counterfeit Act, or COCA, which failed to pass in 2010. A similar House version of the bill, Stop Online Piracy Act, was introduced in October 26, 2011. In the wake of online protests held on January 18, 2012, Senator Majority Leader Harry Reid announced that a vote on the bill will be postponed until issues raised about the bill were resolved. So what did the bill do? Uh, the bill defines infringement as distribution of illegal copies, counterfeit goods, or anti-digital rights management technology by the workaround of DRMs. Uh, infringement exists in facts or circumstances suggest the site is used primarily as a means for engaging it, enabling, or facilitating the activities described. The bill says it does not alter existing substantive trademark or copyright law. The bill provides for enhancement, enhancing enforcement against rogue websites operated and registered overseas and authorized the United States Department of Justice to seek an order in rem against websites dedicated to infringing activities. If thorough due diligence, individual owner or operator cannot be located, the bill requires the Attorney General to serve the notice to the defendant. Once the court issues an order, it can be served on the financial transaction providers, internet advertising services, internet service providers, information location tools to require them to stop financial transactions with the rogue site or remove its links to it. The term information location tool is borrowed from the Digital Millennium Copyright Act and is under, understood to refer to the search engines but could cover other sites and linkages to its content. I don't understand how this enforcement could allow them to basically 
dictate how a non-citizen can operate their website or do do what they're doing are they compelling american companies there from doing this this is a little confusing to me on this because what happens if the site in itself doesn't have a you know american companies that are providing its uh, financial services or its isp or uh, advertisements so the heavy load will be on the search engines you can still be able to search it with a search engine that is um, a foreign based one how you I, it's, okay this is dumb non-authoritative domain name service would be ordered to take a technically feasible and reasonable steps to prevent the domain name from resolving to the ip address of a website that had been found by the court to be dedicated to infringing activities the website can still be reached by its ip address but links for users that use the website's domain would not search it Search engines such as Google will be ordered to I remove or disable access to the internet site associated with the domains set forth in the court order or not serve a hypertext link to such search internet site. Trademark, trademark and copyright holders who have been harmed by the activities of the website dedicated to infringe activities will be able to apply for a court injunction against the domain name to compel financial transaction providers and internet advertising services to stop processing transactions to place ads on the website who will not be able to tame the the domain name remedies available to the attorney general uh, so pretty much the same companies that were for uh, sopa were for figma so here's in the wicca uh, technical objections to the dns blocking and redirecting the bill originated containing measures which allow the shipping of rogue websites out of the domain name system or dns the internet's virtual phone book if a user entered the website of a rogue site it would appear the site did not exist the bill sponsors have said they are removing this provision and according to Shorty Side of Public Knowledge, past attempts to limit copyright infringement online by way of blocking domains have been gener generating criticism that doing so would infracture the domain name system and threaten global functionality of the internet, with the original draft of this bill being no different. By design, all domain servers worldwide would contain identical lists, with the changes initially proposed, servers inside the United States would have records different from the global counterparts, making URLs less universal. Yeah, you, you'd be, in essence, creating two different uh internets and we kind of sort of have that with the firewall of china but this would even fracture things more you can have you can start having this domain name arms race if you will of people just blocking each other right and left uh five internet engineers steve crocker david dagan dan comiskey dan mckeeson and paul bixie prepared a white paper which states that the dns filtering provisions in the original bill a serious technical and security concerns and would break the internet. While other engineers and proponents of the act have, all, all, have called these concerns groundless and without merit. One concern expressed by the network expert is that hackers would offer workarounds to private users to allow access to government seized sites. But these workarounds might also jeopardize security by rejecting unsuspecting users to scam sites. Supporters of the bill, such as the NPA and RA, have argued that widespread supervision of the filtering would be unlikely, and the CEO, Informational Technology and Innovation Foundation, compared the DNS provision to a car door locks, noting that while they aren't foolproof against these, we can still use them. We still use them. Dumb analogy. A browse in, see, here we go. A browse in plugin called MAFIA Fire Redirect was created in March 2011 that redirects visitors to an alternate domain when a site's primary domain has been seized. The Mozilla Foundation says the United States Department of Homeland Security, or DHS, requested by phone that Mozilla remove the plugin, a request which they have not yet com uh, complied. Instead, Mozilla's legal counsel has asked for further information from the DHS, including the legal justification for the request. So, yeah, it's, it's not going to work. Okay, so those are the, the bills and its flaws and who sponsored it, and pretty much uh, both the open, the Protect IP and SOPA didn't get passed. But what it did do is it it galvanized people. It galvanized people to the to the shenanigans, if you will, and the questioning of the nature of the role government has on the internet. Uh, what these different corp companies and corporations that seek to uh, enforce these copyright and patent stuff to prevent people from access, accessing either the counterfeit goods or uh, you know music and movies uh, just the shenanigans and things of that nature and, and to the extent that they're willing to go to to force their um, intellectual properties to the point of where they're willing to seek um, imprisoning people for 
gallery of song, gallery of movie, or even to some, to a point of, you know, for a while there, there was those knockoff coach bags for creating something like that, going to jail, if you will. So, but not just the people that may create the coach bags, but the people that actually purchase the coach bags. So one of the groups to take down SOPA and PIPA was EFF, the Electronic Freedom Frontier Foundation. And uh, they have a, a little retrospective, and they're also part of Blackout July 12th, doing this again to get onto Congress, the U.S. government, not to, you know, saddle the internet, not to account for the internet, if you will. So this article was written this year, January 18, 2017, and it talks about the soap of victory. And we'll kind of go through exactly what this internet blackout did, but the first one of really of its kind um, happened. So five years later, victory over SOPA means more than ever. Commentary by Rainey Correct. January 18, 2017. It would happen slowly at first. A broken hyperlink here and there. A few Google searches and links leading to nowhere. In the beginning, global users of web would have rarely noticed pieces of the internet going dark. Then, there would have been a few investigative journalists piecing things together, and then more coverage as mainstream media picked it up. Adversaries of the open web would have grown bolder, attacking larger and larger websites. Services and companies that would enjoy would have been shut down or drastically changed. Some sites would never exist at all, but internet users would never really know what they're missing. Increasingly rigid control of the internet would have turned surfing the web into an experience more like surfing television, moving from one controlled, expensive online platform to the next, than a straight than a strange maze of eccentric electric information flows that we have today. In a few generations, the wilderness of the web would have been extinguished. Instead, we fought back. On January 18, 2012, an advocacy group like EFF fight for the future and demand progress. Millions of everyday day internet users across the globe orchestrated a digital protest. So powerful it changed the game of DC and around the world. Congress was flooded with emails, calls, and letters, while huge websites like Google and Wikipedia blacked out in solidarity. The internet showed Washington that it could and would defend itself. By defeating SOPA, it didn't happen in a single day. It was a multi-year effort, and many people remember that blackout and forget the countless hours spent raising early alarms about coming censorship methods that work in the form of public advocacy, advocacy research articles and coalition calls was indispensable to create the movement that we defeat so far. So that's very important because not everything is just sparked by one incident or one event. It's literally just a series of events, a series of causes, a series of small to large to medium is ebb and flow and building and getting into the to the mindset of the public and awareness of, you know, of what is coming, you know, of censorship, of corporations taking your privacy, of the government trying to surveil and come after you, or knowing all your different things about what will happen to your different websites and how it would change uh, the, your ability to communicate, if you will, online, to engage and interact and uh, do what you will. And all these different types of efforts of protection, like, for example, pornography, is always attacked. It has all the different formats online, big time in the 90s. That type of censorship. Uh, what else would it be? Big censorship. I would say the music like Napster, that um, the music download of Napster, and then you got uh, lots of things that also, uh, you know, there was LimeWire, uh, Granola, uh, all these different uh, BitTorrent, all these different sites that allowed you to share information, you know, movies, music in a different manner. It kind of, you know, started this whole IP copyright infringement sparking, if you will. But it changed the way the internet engagement was. So, you know, look at MySpace, you know, the, you know, the top eight, all the different music platforms and musicians uploading their, you know, their music because they knew that there was a demand there, that people would go online, they would go to their little MySpace page, they would download their music, share it, come to their shows, buy their t-shirts. There are so many bands that were that became huge, not only just off of Napster, but also because of that social media site of uh, MySpace that became big in the early aughts, from rappers to EDM to, you know, a lot of punk pop bands and uh, screamo, things of that nature, came out of the existence of both Napster and MySpace. And there was an attempt to kind of censor that too as well, because there was a bit of sharing of, you know, different music and videos and things of that nature. But if it hadn't been for Napster, there wouldn't really would have been a MySpace. There wouldn't have been a business for MySpace. There wouldn't even be a SoundCloud. All these different things that people feel find indispensable in 
and the street, that concept of actually streaming music online or streaming movies or television would not have happened if it hadn't been for the attempts of shutting down things, very productive things like Napster and censoring that and going after those type of um, organizations and companies that got into the mindset of people, particularly a lot of the individuals that participated in that group, which will go on to uh, either create their own businesses, either online or you know, in the physical world, engage in the civil action, um, go about their lives, still remember that. And when they see things like that, they're like, no, I'm not going to allow that. Now. That was in 14, 15, 16 minutes, and now I'm an adult here in 2011, and I can do stuff. I can write to my contract, I can vote, I can raise funds, I can get engaged, I can you know, be a blogger, I can do these things, I can take my own business website and put up a little thing that says, hey, let's stop the loop, and here we go. So they were raising those alarm campaigns. While no one knows the details of what the coming four years will bring, we have enough information to be afraid of the future digital rights. With President Trump's taking office, we now expect uh, efforts to undermine encryption, ratchet up of surveillance, dismantle protection from net neutrality. Uh, okay, so undermine encryption. In England, they wish to um, put back doors into messaging apps, ratchet up surveillance. Uh, we talked about one of those um, companies on a word of the metaverse with our favorite, one of our favorite bond villain Peter Phil, you know, bond villain number three. Uh, dismantle protection and net neutrality. That's going on right now. We're in the comment period before, I believe it's August 12th. It's supposed to be a kind of decision period. And attacks on the freedom of the press. Fake news. Uh, now more than ever, we need an engaged, coordinated, powerful force of internet defenders. That's why EF joined dozens of organizations in commemorating the SOPA anniversary today and committing to safeguarding internet freedom against all foes. And we know the core values like creativity, access to knowledge and privacy rights state. A uh, coalition of digital rights, including EF and internet companies, publish a piece today about SOPA blackout and the future of our fight. Looking back from five years in the future, the defeat of SOPA people by an online coalition of internet activists, online communities, and huge business interests is even more amazing. The call to action didn't fall among party lines. It brought together libertarians, progressives, conservatives, and Tea Party activists. It didn't matter if you're a major corporation or individual citizen. Uh, for one day, the line was drawn in the fight for free internet change everything. If the 2012 victory against SOPA and PIPA taught us anything, anything is that whether or not the internet will remain a place that everyone can access reliably and affordable to share, connect, and create freely depends on us. So here is what the the blackout day um, on Fight for the Future, a nonprofit work to defend online freedom. Um, they, they, they're the ones in charge of this uh, site. It's uh, SOPAstrike.com. So here are the numbers. The January 18th blackout slash strike. The numbers are screenshots. So 10 million petition signatures through Free Press, Don't Sit in the Net, um, Havas, uh, Soto, and Move On. Over 8 million calls attempted. The Wikipedia call lookup tool and hundreds of thousands more from partner sites. So this call lookup tool is something that eventually got adopted by a lot of political organizations where you can now through even apps. Apps came out during the uh, 2016 election. And even now in 2017, where you can contact and call uh, your congressperson, and they will look up that information, and you can call from your phone, and they have all that number ready. And even have a little script for you to, if you ever reach a person, to let them know. There was also an automatic um, faxing thing, which would fax comments because uh, the congressional leaders um, are you know, much older. I don't know, I don't know, maybe the median age. I want to say it's like 70, probably not, but very older. So faxes and mails relate to them strongly, more so than maybe the email. So Twitter, the last, I would say, probably because of this, uh, but I would say also because of the last election of 2016, if you tweet your congressional person and they get a lot of inundation to do all on a particular subject matter, they will shift and move. Because again, um, as we talked about disrupting Twitter, Twitter is the town crier. It is a public space where people scream and yell or talk softly in a public space that people hear and and listen to it to some degree. Uh, So let's see. So this was published December 5th, 2016. Membership of the 114th Congress. Uh, This is uh, from FAS.org. Congress has a medium age of 57 years, while the Senate is 61 years. So is not um, heavily tech savvy and for the most
most part considering that many congressional and senator leaders have been in there for decades in some cases, they haven't really had a tremendous need beyond maybe pushing out material and uh, election purposes, but not in their daily activity to be tech savvy. So faxes matter. Uh, faxes matter, uh, mail matters, and all that matters really. And the fact that because of this type of movement, you're seeing those applications help and benefit other political activist uh, causes as well. So 115,000 plus uh, sites participated in the strike, uh, 45,000 on WordPress.com alone, many more not recorded, almost 1 million, almost 1 billion people were blocked from websites. Uh, Twitter stats. So uh, as of late Wednesday, before the West Coast working day even ended, uh, two, two, two million two hundred thousand SOPA tweets, four hundred eleven uh, hashtag Pippa tweets, one hundred five thousand Wikipedia's, one hundred fifty nine stop SOPA, fifty two thousand SOPA strike, seventeen thousand SOPA blackout, and nine thousand blackout SOPA. Uh, senators publicly against Pippa, uh, November sixteenth, two thousand eleven. American Censorship Day, that was November 17th, 2011. There was only one guy on November 16th. November 17th, that was five. Uh, ADM of January 18th, 2012, one, two, three, four, five, six. 8 p.m. January 18th, 2012, we have two, four, six, Senators that were opposing. And they have uh, the screenshots of the various cards of um, websites that put up when you went to like Wikipedia. They had this image Imagine a world without free knowledge. For over a decade, we spent millions of hours building the largest encyclopedia in human history. And right now, the U.S. Congress is considering legislation that would fatally damage the free and open internet. Before 24 hours to raise an awareness, we are blacking out Wikipedia. Learn more. Contact your representative to your zip code and look up. So they had this card where you could go to any um, Wikipedia sites. Uh, Reddit was down. SOPA and PIPA damaged WordPress. Today we fight back. Google, end privacy, not liberty. Uh, so Google went down. Uh, NYC protests. It was physical protests where people went to the streets. Uh, WordPress.org protests to protect the IP Act. Many websites are blacked out today to contest uh, proposed U.S. legislation that threatens internet freedom and stop the Internet Privacy Act or SOPA and protect IP Act from personal blogs to Wikipedia sites all over the web, including this one, and ask you to help stop this dangerous legislation from being passed. Please watch the video below to learn how this legislation will affect internet freedom and scroll down and take action. Uh, PeterGabriel.com, Oatmeal, which is a... Uh, YouTube and internet, you know, comedy site. Save the internet. Tumblr. Uh, there's a question whether Tumblr, since it's gotten bought, is going to join in. Drudge Report. Stop Sopa, stop slash by Congresswoman Anna Esquiza. Wired. Boing Boing. And so far and so forth. So this is a very important and impressive um, movement. And this is in 2012. So in 2012, Netflix was just kind of getting in there. I don't think Amazon participated in this. Let's see, Snapchat wasn't in existence. I think Instagram just may have came into existence. So there are certain social media sites that people uh, take for granted today that weren't quite around or as popular. Um, you had the how hashtag with Twitter, but there wasn't an actual blackout date where you could access your individual profiles through Twitter. Uh, let's see. It'd be interesting to see if Facebook, what people do on Facebook. Now that Facebook has these um, filters that you can put, whether or not they'll have a filter for blackout date, or filters across all these different um, social media sites because they're pretty much clones of one another. But they were able to basically disrupt the internet for a 24 hour period and also disrupt Congress with a massive amount of people contacting Congress and engaging them, many of them for the first time, plus so many people taking the streets both in D.C. and New York, if you will, and, and other places throughout the states that in something that was just, it almost in a sense, by Congress perspective, almost an instantaneous manner, like almost like a flash mob of people coming out and saying no to this, 
kind of gave a startle to Congress and also just in general the power of not only social networking, social media, but the power of the internet, but the power of these technology companies, which for the most part has been bantered around by Congress for the most part because Silicon Valley, while many of them do engage and do all of that stuff for the U.S. government, and in some cases not in the passive manner for the benefit of everyone, as, the, as Snowden and the uh, WikiLeaks have demonstrated, as well as some of these um, Vault 7 and uh, Shadow Broker tools have demonstrated that you know, their engagement with the government has both been adversarial and cooperative, but also very distant. Uh, Silicon Valley is not necessarily so eager to, at least initially, it's somewhat changed, I would say, in the last seven years, and even a little bit more after this um, protest to get in bed with the government. They're not like other industries that are really entwined. Um, not, don't get me wrong, they still have their own like, legislative bodies, they have their the people that go out there and champion their particular companies or businesses or their um, particular uh, sphere of influence and their technology, if you will. But there is not like oil and gas and banking and all these other industries that have been around for much longer, but they're not just not as entwined, if you will. So it became very startling for this Congress people to see just how, how much power they can just flex, if you will, and it's a very almost brief period of time. This is from one of the biggest voices uh, individualistically. And I have a link in the show notes to his speech that he has given about Stop and Sopa and how he became involved. And I encourage you to watch that um, video. But Aaron Schwartz, a big internet activist, uh, one of the principal creators for a lot of the things that we use, like RS feed, um, We'll get into about Aaron Schwartz, the man. Um, we talked about a little bit about him in, in the beginning of this because he was part of SOPA and bringing it about. And this might have put him on the radar of the government as a result of um, his political thoughts and actions. Um, might explain why um, the charges against him uh, for what his actions at um, MIT for releasing documents might have been so harsh. But here we go. Aaron Schwartz joined the fight against SOPA. In a previous unpublished essay, the late Aaron Schwartz explained how he came to be part of the fight to save the internet. For me, it all started with a phone call. This is by John Hernan. It was published January 18th, 2013, so two year in, a one-year anniversary. So the following essay is an expert from Hacky Politics, How Geeks, Progressives, the Tea Party, Gamers, um, Anarchists, and Suits Teen Up to Beat SOPA and Save the Internet. I will also have a link in the show notes to where you can, if you want to, purchase the book through Amazon for, through affiliate link. But it's a very fascinating book and is part of my summer reading um, reviews I'm doing on Hiroshima Thought Bubble. But here we go. Uh, for me, it all started with a phone call. It was back in September 2010 when I got a call from my friend Peter. He said, Aaron, he said, there's an amazing bill you have to take a look at. He said, what is it? It's called... Uh, COCA, the Combat Online Infringement and Counterfeit Act. Oh, Peter, I said, I don't care about copyright law. Maybe you're right. Maybe Hollywood's right. But either way, it's really, is it really such a big deal? I'm not going to waste my life fighting over a little issue like copyright. Healthcare, financial reform, those are the sort of issues I work on and not something obscure like copyright. I could hear Peter grumble. Look, I don't have time to argue with you, but it doesn't matter for right now because this isn't a bill about copyright. It's not. No, it's a bill about freedom of speech. And now I was listening. Peter explained what all you have probably long since learned, that the bill would let the government devise a list of websites that Americans weren't allowed to visit. Over the next day, I came up with lots of ways to try to explain this to people. I said it was a great firewall of America. I said it was an internet blacklist. I said it was online censorship. But I think it's worth taking a step back and put inside the rhetoric and think about how radical this bill really was. Yes, there are lots of times when the government makes rules about speech. If you slander a private figure, if you buy television that, that lies to people, ad that lies to people, if you... If your wild party plays booming music all night, in all those cases, the government can stop you. But this is something radically different. It wasn't that the government went to people and asked them to take down particular material that was illegal. It shut down whole websites. Essentially, it stopped Americans from communicating entirely with certain other groups. And there's nothing really like it in U.S. law. If you play loud music all night, the government doesn't slap you with an order requiring you to play mute for the next couple of weeks. They don't say nobody can make any more noise inside your house. There's a specific complaint which they ask you to specifically remedy, and then your life goes on. 
The closest I could find in a case where the government was at war with an adult bookstore. The place kept selling porn, the government kept getting it declared illegal, and then it frustrated, they decided to shut down the whole bookstore down. But even that was declared unconstitutional and a violation of the First Amendment. You might say, surely, that uh, COCA would get declared unconstitutional, but <laughs> I knew that the Supreme Court had one blind spite around the First Amendment. More than anything, more than slander and libel, more than pornography, more even than child pornography, it was copyright. When it came to copyright, it was like part of the justice's brain shut off and totally forgot about the First Amendment. You can go on the sense that deep down they didn't think the First Amendment applied when copyright was at issue. Which means that if you want to censor the internet, if you want to come up with a way that the government could shut down access to a particular website, this bill would be the one way to do it. If you said that it was about pornography, it would probably get overturned by the courts, just like the adult bookstore case. But claiming it was about copyright, it might just sneak through. And that was terrifying because copyright was absolutely everywhere. If you want to shut down WikiLeaks, it would be a bit of a stretch to claim you're doing it because they were distributing child pornography. But it won't be hard at all to claim they were violating copyright because everything is copyrighted. These words are copyrighted. It's easy to accidentally copy something. So easy, in fact, that we found the leading Republican supporter of uh, Coca, Orrin Hatch, had legally copied a bunch of code in his own Senate website. Even Orrin Hatch said Senate website was found to be violating copyright law. What's the chance they wouldn't be able to pin something on us, on, on any of us? So one of the groups to take down SOPA and PIPA was EFF, the Electronic Freedom Frontier Foundation. And uh, they have a, a little retrospective, and they're also part of Blackout July 12th, doing this again to get onto Congress, the U.S. government, not to you know, saddle the internet, not to hamper the internet. So this article was written this year, January 18, 2017, and it talks about the SOPA victory. And we'll kind of go through exactly what this internet blackout did, but the first one of really of its kind um, happened. So five years later, victory over SOPA means more than ever. Commentary by Rainey Moret, uh, January 18, 2017. It would happen slowly at first, a broken hyperlink here and there, a few Google searches and links leading to nowhere. In the beginning, global users of the web would have rarely noticed pieces of the internet going dark. Then, there would have been a few investigative journalists piecing things together, and then more coverage as mainstream media picked it up. Adversaries of the open web would have grown bolder, attacking larger and larger websites. Services and companies that enjoyed would have been shut down or drastically changed. Some sites would never exist at all, but internet users would never really know what they're missing. Increasingly rigid control of the internet would have turned surfing the web into an experience more like surfing television moving from one controlled, expensive online platform to the next, then a, stra then a strange maze of eccentric electric information flows that we have today. In a few generations, the wilderness of the web would have been extinguished. Instead, we fought back. On January 18, 2012, an advocacy group like EFF fight for the future and demand progress. Millions of everyday day internet users across the globe orchestrated a digital protest. So powerful, it changed the game of DC and around the world. Congress was flooded with emails, calls, and letters, while huge websites like Google and Wikipedia blacked out in solidarity. The internet showed Washington that it could and would defend itself. By defeating SOPA, it didn't happen in a single day. It was a multi-year effort, and many people remember that blackout and forget the countless hours spent raising early alarms about coming censorship methods. That worked in the form of public advocacy, advocacy research articles, and coalition calls was indispensable to create the movement that we defeat SOPA. So that's very important because not everything is just sparked by one incident or one event. It's literally just a series of events, a series of causes, a series of small to large to medium is ebb and flow and building and getting into the to the mindset of the public and the awareness of you know of what is coming, you know, of censorship, of corporations taking your privacy, of the government trying to surveil and come after you or knowing all your different things about what have happened to your different websites and how it changed uh, the, your ability to communicate, if you will, online, to engage and interact and, and do what you will. And all these different types of efforts of protection, like, for example, pornography, is always attacked in all the different formats online, big time in the 90s. That type of form of censorship. Uh, what else was it? Big censorship. I would say the music, like Napster, that... Um, Music download of Napster, and then you got um, Mozilla, uh, you know, there was LimeWire, uh, Granola, 
uh, all these different uh, BitTorrent, all these different sites that allowed you to share information, you know, movies, music in a different manner. It kind of, you know, started this whole IP copyright infringement sparking, if you will. But it changed the way the internet engagement was. So, you know, look at MySpace, you know, you have the, you know, the top eight and all the different music platforms and musicians uploading their, you know, their music because they knew that there was a demand there that people would go online, they would go to their little MySpace page, they would download their music, share it, come to their shows, buy their t-shirts. There are so many bands that were, that became huge, not only just up in after, but also because of that social media site of uh, MySpace that became big in the early aughts, from rappers to EDM to, you know, a lot of punk pop bands and uh, screamo, things of that nature came out of the existence of both Napster and MySpace. And there was a chance to kind of censor that too as well because there was a bit of sharing of, you know, different music and videos and things of that nature. But if it hadn't been for Napster, there wouldn't really would have been a MySpace. There wouldn't have been a business for MySpace. There wouldn't even be a SoundCloud. All these different things that people feel to find indispensable. You know, the street that concept of actually streaming music online or streaming movies or television would not have happened if it hadn't been for the attempts of shutting down things, very productive things like Napster, and censoring that, and going after those type of uh, organizations and companies that got into the mindset of people, particularly a lot of the individuals that participated in that group, which will go on to uh, either create their own businesses, either online or you know, in the physical world, engage in the civil action, uh, go about their lives, still remember that. And, see things like that, they're like, no, I'm not going to allow that. Now. That was in 14, 15, 16 minutes, and now I'm an adult here in 2011, and I can do stuff. I can write to my contract, I can vote, I can raise funds, I can get engaged, I can, you know, be a blogger, I can do these things, I can take my own business website and put up a little thing that says, hey, let's stop doing this. So here we go. So today we're raising those alarm campaigns. While no one knows the details of what the coming four years will bring, we have enough information to be afraid of the future digital rights. With President Trump's taking office, we now expect uh, efforts to undermine encryption, match up of surveillance, dismantle protection for net neutrality. Uh, okay, so undermine encryption. In England, they wish to um, put backdoors into messaging now. Ratchet up surveillance. Uh, we talked about one of those um, companies on a word of the metaverse with our favorite, one of our favorite bond villains, Peter Thiel, you know, bond villain number three. Uh, dismantle protection and net neutrality. That's going on right now. We're in the comment period before. I believe it was August 12th. It was the kind of decision period. And it's actually on the freedom of the press. Fake news. Uh, now more than ever, we need an engaged, coordinated, powerful force of internet defenders. That's why EF joined dozens of organizations in, in commemorating the SOPA anniversary today and committing to safeguarding internet freedom against all foes. And we know the core values like creativity, access to knowledge, and privacy are at stake. Uh, coalition of Digital Rights, including EF and Internet Companies, publish a piece today about SOPA blackout and the future of our fight. Looking back from five years in the future, the defeat of SOPA people by an online coalition of Internet activists, online communities, and huge business interests is even more amazing. The call to action didn't fall along party lines. It brought together libertarians, progressive, conservatives, and Tea Party activists. It didn't matter if you're a major corporation or individual citizen. Uh, for one day, the line was drawn and the fight for free internet changed everything. If the 2012 victory against SOPA and PIPA taught us anything, anything is that whether or not the internet will remain a place that everyone can access reliably and affordable to share, connect, and create freely depends on us. So here is what the the blackout day um, on Fight for the Future, a nonprofit work to defend online freedom. Um, they, they, they're one to charge this uh, site. It's uh, sopastrike.com. So here are the numbers. The January 18th blackout slash strike. The numbers are screenshots. So 10 million petition signatures through Free Press, Don't Sit in the Net, um, Avas, uh, Soto, and Move On. Over 8 million calls attempted, the Wikipedia call lookup tool, and hundreds of thousands more from partner sites. So this call lookup tool is something that eventually got adopted by a lot of political organizations where you can now through even apps. Apps came out during the um, 2016 election, and even now in 2017 where you can contact and call uh, your congressperson, and they will look up that information, and you can call from your phone, and have all that number ready, and you even have a little script for you to, if you ever reach a person, to let them know. There was also an automatic um, faxing thing, which would fax comments, because 
uh, the congressional leaders um, are you know, much older, and I think maybe the median age, uh, let me check what the median age is. I want to say it's like 70, probably not, but very older. So faxes and mails relate to them strongly, more so than maybe the email. So Twitter, the last, I would say, probably because of this, uh, but I would say also because of the last election, 2016, if you tweet your congressional person and they get a lot of innovation to do all on a particular subject matter, they will shift and move. Because again, um, as we talked about disrupting Twitter, Twitter is the town crier. It is a public space where people scream and yell or talk softly in a public space and people hear it and have listen to it to some degree. Uh, so let's see. So this was published December 5th, 2016. Membership of the 140, 114th Congress. Uh, this is uh, from FAS.org. Congress has a medium age of 57 years, while the Senate is 61 years. So, who is it that too far off? It's not um, heavily tech savvy. And for the most part, considering that many congressional and senator leaders have been in there for decades in some cases, they haven't really had a tremendous need beyond maybe pushing out material and uh, election purposes, but that in their daily activity to be tech savvy. So faxes matter. Uh, faxes matter, uh, mail matters, and all of that matters really. And the fact that because of this type of movement, you're seeing those applications help and benefit other political activist uh, causes as well. So 115 thousand plus uh, sites participated in the strike, uh, 45,000 on WordPress.com alone, many more not recorded, almost 1 million, almost 1 billion people were blocked from websites, uh, Twitter stats. So uh, as of late Wednesday before the West Coast working day even ended, uh, 2, 2, 2, 200,000 SOPA tweets, 411 uh, hashtag HIPAA tweets. 105,000 Wikipedias, 159 Stop SOPA, 52,000 SOPA Stark, 17,000 SOPA Blackout, and 9,000 Blackout SOPA. Uh, senators publicly against PIPA, uh, November 16th, 2011, American Censorship Day, that was November 17th, 2011. There was only one guy on November 16th, November 17th, that was five. Uh, ADM of January 18th, 2012, one, two, three, four, five, six. 8 p.m. January 18th, 2012, we have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 15, 20, 22, 14, 16, 18, 30, 32, 34, 36 senators that were opposed. And they have uh, the screenshots of the various cards of um, websites that put up when you went to, like, Wikipedia. They had this image. Imagine a world without free knowledge. For over a decade, we spent millions of hours building the largest encyclopedia in human history, and right now the U.S. Congress is considering legislation that would fatally damage the free and open internet. But for 24 hours to raise an awareness, we are blacking out Wikipedia. One more, contact your representative to your zip code and look up. So they had this card where you could go to any um, Wikipedia sites. Uh, Reddit was down. SOPA and PIPA damaged WordPress. Today we fight back. Google, end privacy, not liberty. Uh, so Google went down. Uh, NYC protests, it was physical protests where people went to the streets. Uh, WordPress.org protests to protect the IP Act. Many websites are blacked out today to contest uh, proposed U.S. legislation that threatens internet freedom and stop the Internet Privacy Act or SOPA and protect IP Act from personal blogs and Wikipedia sites all over the web, including this one, and ask you to help stop this dangerous legislation from being passed. Please watch the video below to learn how this legislation will affect internet freedom and scroll down and take action. Uh, PeterGabriel.com, Oatmeal, which is a uh, YouTube and internet, you know, comedy site. Save the internet, Tumblr. Uh, there's a question whether Tumblr, since it's gotten bought, is going to join in. Drudge Report, Stop Soko, Stop Slash, by Congresswoman Anna Isgisa, Wired, Boing Boing, and so far and so forth. So this is a very important and impressive uh, movement, and this is in 2012, so... In 2012, Netflix was just kind of getting in there. I don't think Amazon participated in this. Let's see, Snapchat wasn't in existence. 
happy Instagram just may have came into existence. So there are certain social media sites that people uh, take for granted today that weren't quite around or as popular. Um, you had the how hashtag with Twitter, but there was no actual blackout date where you could access your individual profiles from Twitter. Uh, let's see. It'd be interesting to see if Facebook, what people do on Facebook. You now that Facebook has these um, filters that you can put, whether or not they'll have a filter for blackout date or filters across all these different um, social media sites because they're pretty much clones of one another. But they were able to basically disrupt the internet for a 24-hour period and also disrupt Congress with a massive amount of people time-packing Congress and engaging them, many of them for the first time. Plus, so many people taking the streets both in D.C. and New York, if you will, and, and other places throughout the states. That, and something that was just, it almost in a sense, by Congress' perspective, almost an instantaneous manner, like almost like a flash mob of people coming out and saying no to this, kind of gave a startle to Congress and also just in general the power of not only social networking, social media, but the power of the internet, but the power of these technology companies, which for the most part has been bantered around by Congress for the most part because Silicon Valley, while many of them do engage and do a lot of stuff for the U.S. government, and in some cases not in the passive manner for the benefit of everyone, as, the, as Snowden and the uh, WikiLeaks have demonstrated, as well as some of these um, Vault 7 and uh, Shadow Broker tools have demonstrated that you know, their engagement with the government has both been adversarial and cooperative, but also very distant. Uh, Silicon Valley is not necessarily so eager to, at least initially, it's somewhat changed, I would say, in the last seven years, and even a little bit more after this um, protest to get in bed with the government. They're not like other industries that are really entwined. Um, not, don't get me wrong, they still have their own like, legislative bodies, they have their the people that go out there and champion their particular companies or businesses or their um, particular uh, sphere of influence and their technology, if you will. But there is not like oil and gas and banking and all these other industries that have been around for much longer, but they're not just not as entwined, if you will. So it became very startling for this Congress people to see just how, how much power they can just flex, if you will, in just a very almost brief period of time. This is from one of the biggest voices uh, individualistically, and I have a link in the show notes to his speech that he has given about Stop and Silva and how he became involved, and I encourage you to watch that um, video. But Aaron Schwartz, a big internet activist, uh, one of the principal creators for a lot of the things that we use, like RS feed, um, We'll get into about Aaron Schwartz, the man. Um, we talked about a little bit about him in, in the beginning of this because he was part of SOPA and bringing it about. And this might have put him on the radar of the government as a result of um, his political thoughts and actions. Um, might explain why um, the charges against him uh, for what his actions at um, MIT for releasing documents might have been so harsh. But here we go. Aaron Schwartz joined the fight against Silva. In a previous unpublished essay, the late Aaron Schwartz explained how he came to be part of the fight to save the internet. For me, it all started with a phone call. This is by John Hernan. It was published January 18th, 2013, so two year in, a one-year anniversary. So the following essay is an expert from Hacking Politics, How Geeks, Progressives, the Tea Party, Gamers, um, Anarchists, and Suits Teen Up to Beat Sopa and Save the Internet. I will also have a link in the show notes to where you can, if you want to, purchase the book through Amazon for, through a Villa link. But it's a very fascinating book and is part of my summer reading um, reviews I'm doing on Hiroshima Thought Bubble. But here we go. Uh, for me, it all started with a phone call. It was back in September 2010 when I got a call from my friend Peter. He said, Aaron, he said, there's an amazing bill you have to take a look at. He said, what is it? It's called... Uh, COCA, the Combat Online Infringement and Counterfeit Act. Oh, Peter, I said, I don't care about copyright law. Maybe you're right. Maybe Hollywood's right. But either way, it's really, is it really such a big deal? I'm not going to waste my life fighting over a little issue like copyright. 
healthcare, financial reform, those are sort of issues I work on and not something obscure like copyright. I could hear Peter grumble, look, I don't have time to argue with you, but it doesn't matter for right now because this isn't a bill about copyright. It's not, no, it's a bill about freedom of speech. And now I was listening. Peter explained what all of you have probably long since learned, that the bill would let the government devise a list of websites that Americans weren't allowed to visit. Over the next day, I came up with lots of ways to try to explain this to people. I said it was a great firewall of America. I said it was an internet blacklist. I said it was online censorship. But I think it's worth taking a step back and put inside the rhetoric and think about how radical this bill really was. Yes, there are lots of times when the government makes rules about speech. If you slander a private figure, if you buy television that, that lies to people, ad that lies to people, if you... If your wild party plays booming music all night, in all those cases, the government can stop you. But this is something radically different. It wasn't that the government went to people and asked them to take down particular material that was illegal. It shut down whole websites. Essentially, it stopped Americans from communicating entirely with certain other groups. And there's nothing really like it in U.S. law. If you play loud music all night, the government doesn't slap you with an order requiring you to play mute for the next couple of weeks. They don't say nobody can make any more noise inside your house. There's a specific complaint which they ask you to specifically remedy, and then your life goes on. The closest I could find in a case where the government was at war with an adult bookstore. The place kept selling porn, the government kept getting it declared illegal, and then it frustrated, they decided to shut down the whole bookstore down. But even that was declared unconstitutional and a violation, violation of the First Amendment. You might say, surely, that uh, COCA would get declared unconstitutional, but <laughs> I knew that the Supreme Court had one blind spite around the First Amendment. More than anything, more than slander and libel, more than pornography, more even than child pornography, it was copyright. When it came to copyright, it was like part of the justice's brain shut off and totally forgot about the First Amendment. You can go on the sense that deep down they didn't think the First Amendment applied when copyright was at issue. Which means that if you want to censor the internet, if you want to come up with a way that the government could shut down access to a particular website, this bill would be the one way to do it. If you said that it was about pornography, it would probably get overturned by the courts just like the adult bookstore case. But claiming it was about copyright, it might just sneak through. And that was terrifying, because copyright was absolutely everywhere. If you want to shut down WikiLeaks, it would be a bit of a stretch to claim you're doing it because they were distributing child pornography. But it won't be hard at all to claim they were violating copyright, because everything is copyrighted. These words are copyrighted. It's easy to accidentally copy something. So easy, in fact, that we found the leading Republican supporter of uh, Coca, Orrin Hatch, had legally copied a bunch of code in his own Senate website. Even Orrin Hatch's Senate website was found to be violating copyright law. What's the chance they wouldn't be able to pin something on us, on, on any of us? So here is a build your own project. It's called Pump.io. And if you are someone who's into streaming service or looking to create your uh, type of social network, social network. So what is it for? Um, I post something with my followers see there's a rough idea behind the pump. There's an A idea behind to find an AIP MDI file. It uses activity. Okay, so, on. so the software is used for at least three scenarios. Mobile for first social network, activity streaming functionality for existing app, and experimenting with social software. It comes with a web UI. So you're able to, if you're seeking to build your own um, social network or streaming service you can like get pop that IO and start your building blocks if you will you know mastodon is very big i wonder if someone's already beginning to incorporate something like that as their server to uh, plug in mastodon so that you can do things like uh the bookmarkers and images video audio things like that geo check-ins uh, do all the things that uh, people have come associated with a social network but within your own api within your own server so pump.io is something to look at. There's a link um, on the show notes, and you can view everything off of GitHub. What I use, tech that I'm using, I recently have um, obtained an iPhone 7 Plus, and I love it. I haven't f gone full board in using all the different features with it because I don't have the, um, I need to get a protection and a, a little screen thing before I, I go nuts, if you will, but yes, um, Apple has had me since the shuffle when it comes to your mobile devices, and I like it. I really like it a lot. I still have an Android. I have an Android I use uh, for specific stuff, but yeah, my I have an iPhone 7. I've become one of the sheeple, if you will. And I have a link in the show notes to um, an Amazon link to not only the iPhone 7, but also to a book about um, how SOPA was stopped. Uh, that you can purchase on um, Amazon if you like. And this helps, you know, 
his affiliate link so it helps support the show. Uh, manifestos for an active archive. Uh, this manifesto is a work in progress. The text introduces the ideas and innovations behind the active archive project led by Constance in collaboration with um, Artuliki and was initiated in 2006. The project aims at creating a free software platform to connect practices of library, media library, publications on paper as magazines, books, and catalogs, productions of audiovisual objects, events, workshops, uh, discouraged productions, etc. Practices which can take place online are in various geographical places, and which can be at various stages of visibility for reasons of rights of access or for reasons of research and privacy conditions. The development will take place during 2008 to 2009, and a regular workshop will be organized to simulate dialogue, dialogue between future users, developers, and cultural workers and researchers. Creating web pages and displaying information online has become easier and easier for non-expert users. The Active Archives project starts from the observation that most of the interesting cultural archives that have been developed over the last few years have taken advantage of those new facilities for instant publishing, but most of them in the form of websites that mirror regular information brochures, announcements, and text publishing. Often they are conceived as we give information to you, and within Active Archives we are aimed to set up a multi directional communication channel are interested in making information circulate back and forth. We like to give you material, material way and receive it in transform, enriched by different connection, contests, and, and contradictions. Decentralizing the archive. We, when we want to share with other cultural associations and groups slash institutions, the challenge, challenge is as follows. How do we share information together? How do we channel information through each other's network under which conditions, how do we produce digital content together? To develop common infrastructures, we will need to discuss what kind of licenses we prefer and work on norms in a common agreement on formats. We also need to find a shared understanding of classifications or maybe to first question existing ones. Digital culture archives today fall into two categories, fragmented archives and over-centralized archives. Fragmented archives look like isolated islands. Every institution sits on top of its treasure and tries to regulate and control the way it's used with as much offering, offering a timid RS feed. Centralized archives gather collections and resources from different origins, but disconnect the material from its original context. Accessibility and sociability come at a cost of le legitimization. An active archive is a decentralized archive, which is not only open for reading, but also for reappropriation, re comment, divergence, transformation. This manifesto is a plea of such decentralized archive, an archive constituted from many sites and voices that keep their own contents without a free of sharing, mirroring, connecting, and using common protocols, owning our infrastructure. If public television channels decided to publish their archives on YouTube, libraries work in partnership with Google, etc., why does the active archive that not make use of existing Web 2.0 infrastructure? Uh, Flickr, Flickr Plus, MySpace Plus, Facebook, with a bit of delicious to glue it all together, who needs more? But to upload digital culture on the servers of dot-com billionaires might not be a, such a good idea after all. How much influence the, influence the functionalities of Web 2.0 had it popularized in the digital archive? We need to be aware of their terms to, of use. We would like to prevent that cultural archive serve as footage for advanced, uh, serve, serve as a footage for ad placement on, or a honeypot for marketing profilers. And for this reason, we need to make this effort to build our own infrastructure. An active archive should provide to its contributors a clean and clear contract where the terms of the participation are fair and legible for everyone. The goal of the active archive is to produce more interesting content in the first place, to make profit in the monitoring the users and selling their behavioral patterns. Only when the, the different parties involved own their own infrastructure and accept to share it, they can share the conditions for access without strings attached. This means open content licenses for all materials stored so that conditions for use are clear for everyone and infrastructure built with free software so that everyone can own the source code, distributing more than the text. An active archive needs to go beyond more mere text publishing. Artists, cultural groups, and institutional institutions regularly produce video and audio images for various communications or creative purposes. It is necessary to take into account the media content required requires different material configurations. They need more disk space and more bandwidth. Therefore, they require clever strategies of distribution. Peer-to-peer -peer networks have pioneered large-scale experiments with the distribution of audiovisual media, and it's time to learn from them. Integrating audiovisual media is not just adding another type of file. It requires a new approach to navigation, searching, liking, subtitling, and transact translation so that the audio and web, the audio and video content connect to text-based content because otherwise those files will remain black holes in the archives. Promoting reuse. The material that is made available through the active archive is thought of as a source material for other works. That means systems need to be 
put into place to make references and reuse the material easy, but also making sure that versions of the material can filter back to the place it originally, originally came from. These systems are partially technical and partially culture. The series commissions, workshops, exhibits, and publications will inspire creative use, between tags and um, on along these. To improve the search facilities, to group uh, elements, to link them, integrate new meaning and new experiences, an archive needs a system of classifications. Librarians and archivists are used to working with fixed standards, but the work produced and discussed within con contemporary culture tends to escape those classification schemes. An active archive requires the creation and discussion of vocabularies and taxonomies that can evolve, diverge, or merge. These vocabularies and, tax and taxonomies should neither be brutal, top or down, or completely flat. The system should, should stimulate the sharing of common classifications, allow for divergence, and promote the convergence of knowledge trees. Active archive needs a classification system with a difference. Moving through new gestures. Sharing is the principal motivation to create an active archive. That means that we need to update our assumption about users of such an active, the source that they are used, and the circulation of its content. An active archive is not a black box with a download button. It's an information reconfigured and has to start now. And this came out in 2006. Uh, the creator of this is constant in collaboration with Ar Archikuliki and Pierre, Pierre um, Tigerbart. And um, there's a link um, to them um, attached to this digital manifesto. So that's it for this episode. Thank you for listening. I'm disconnecting now, and I will see you out on the streets. Thank you for listening. Please rate and review either through iTunes or Stitchers or any of the podcasting apps that you're currently using to listen to this show. Thank you, and until next time. This has been a Herosha Shine Space Odyssey Network production.